Welcome to my first video about the stern gerlach experiment, where we will prove quantum effects at home. This is one of the biggest projects I have ever attempted, and I hope you join me on this adventure. A little note at the beginning. This is the first video in a multi-part series. Therefore, I will use the first few minutes to explain what it is that we will be doing. After that, I will build a stand for my cryo pump, on which the apparatus will be mounted later, and I will reassemble the pump. If you want to jump right in, you can click on the appropriate chapter. I remember sitting in a lecture on quantum chemistry. I had the feeling of being the dumbest person in the room. My professor's words became a mush of Greek letters, eigenvalues and operators. And suddenly I heard something that made me sit up and take notice. The stern gerlach experiment. An experiment that makes these difficult to understand quantum effects tangible. So what was the stern gerlach experiment? This experiment was performed in 1922 by Otto Stern and Walter Gerlach. What did the two of them do? To say it up front, I am not a physicist, so I will make the explanation a little simpler. If you notice any mistakes, feel free to correct me in the comments. This experiment showed that even a system at an atomic scale shows quantum properties. And it showed that the spin of electrons is not random, but quantized, which means it can have only two values. The setup of the experiment consisted of a tube that was under high vacuum. The pressure was around 1.3 times 10 to the power of minus 5 millibars, or 0.0013 pascal. This was achieved by a roughing pump and two diffusion pumps. In keeping with the style of the time, these were of course filled with mercury. I actually bought a part of a diffusion pump on eBay a while ago. It was very cheap because the inner part, the stack or Christmas tree, how it is sometimes called, was missing. And I like the fact that it's made out of glass because you can see um, how it works. I think the idea of a vacuum pump with no moving parts except the oil that is boiling in here is fascinating. And I also 3D printed the stack because I thought maybe it is possible to make it out of metal, but I haven't gotten to do it. And I think at least I'm a little bit worried that the different um, thermal expansion coefficients between the metal and the glass could cause the glass to crack right here. If you have any idea how to uh, rebuild this pump or if you have any ideas what to do with this beautiful pump, it looked absolutely horrible when I got it, um, let me know in the comments. At one end of the tube there was an atomic beam furnace. The an atomic beam furnace is just a glorified oven where a metal in this case, or another element in this case, it's a metal, silver is heated until atoms are released from the metal. These atoms travel to a tiny slit. Here you can see the shape of the slit. And since there's a high vacuum, these atoms will travel in one direction until they hit something. So they travel down this tube until they hit a glass plate at the end right here. After several hours, the experiment was ended and they removed the glass plate at the end here and looked at it. And what they saw is what you can see on the picture I'm showing you right now. A simple line of silver atoms that condensed on the glass plate. And that makes sense, it's what you would expect. The silver atoms fly to the slit and when they hit the glass plate they collect there and form a line of silver atoms with the shape of the slit. The experiment was then repeated a second time, this time with an important change. There were two electromagnets um, placed in the line where the silver atoms fly through. One important fact is that the poles of these magnets were shaped in such a way that they create an inhomogeneous magnetic field. You want an inhomogeneous magnetic field because in a homogeneous magnetic field the dipoles would only align with the magnetic field because the forces exerted on the opposite ends of the dipole cancel each other out and you wouldn't be able to deflect anything. But what they saw when they did the same experiment, this time with the magnets turned on, is that they got two lines on their glass plate. I will show you the picture right now. And that's a little bit weird. You would expect a continuous distribution of 
silver atoms on the glass plate. If you think about the electron as a spinning ball, except it's not a ball and it's not spinning, <laughs> um, you would expect them to be deflected um, in a statistical manner. You would get a, a Gauss curve. But it's not the case. Um, and that shows that the spin of the electrons is only in two states, plus one half and minus one half. Looking at the electron configuration of the silver atom, you can see that the atom is neutral, so there's no way a charged atom is responsible for the deflection. And there's only one electron on the most, uh, most outer shell. And that means that the quantum properties of this um, atom is determined by this electron on the most outer shell. And this electron is what causes this deflection depending on its spin. I would love to recreate the experiment with silver because it's so tangible. You can basically see the result of the experiment. But there are several problems with this. The first one is that the silver has to get pretty hot until it emits atoms, which means the temperature of the atomic beam furnace has to be higher. The second problem, and I think more important problem, is that the experiment has to run for several hours until I can even check if it worked. Which means if I have any problems with the alignment or my atomic beam furnace, I have to run the experiment for several hours, check again, do some changes, run it again for several hours, and I, don't, I just don't think it's feasible. But there's another way. It is possible to use potassium. Potassium um, doesn't need to get that hot to emit atoms. Around 200 degrees Celsius is good enough. And then instead of a glass plate, I will be using a detector right here. And the way this experiment works is that you can use a bellow right here, so a flexible hose out of stainless steel. And what you do is you swivel this end here, and depending on where it is, you can detect an atom beam. In the middle you won't detect an atom beam, or here you will detect an atom beam again. And by swiveling that and um, making a graph out of the signal and the location of this detector, you can basically um, recreate the same experiment, but you immediately see if you can detect something or not. Um, so you immediately see if you have a problem with your alignment or something similar. So there are three main components that are the most crucial and hardest to get right. The first one is the atomic beam oven or atomic beam furnace, because you have to collimate the beam and then use a narrow slit. I'm thinking about using a slit that is also used for spectrometers. The magnets here, because they have to pass through the KF40 tube, all of this will be built in KF40 flanges. They have to pass through there, be vacuum tight, and the shape of these is pretty important. I can show you the shape right now. And also the alignment. So these will be pretty hard to make. If you have um, the possibility to machine metal and you want to support this project, maybe you have an idea um, and maybe you can contact me if you want to uh, help me by machining some metal parts for me. And the other important part is the detector. It's a Lackmuir Taylor detector. And I will talk about how each of these components works when I'm building them because I think it's just too much for one video. And yeah, the third component that is probably pretty hard to make is this detector. But we will do it step by step. And the first thing I'm going to do today is to build a stand for the pump, rebuild the pump. And afterwards in my second video, I will just try to make a, an atomic beam that I can detect back here. I won't uh, use any magnets so I can test the system in its easiest or simplest configuration.
This is the finished stand I built for the pump. As you can see, I 3D printed a bracket. It was the bracket you saw in the last clip. It just serves a purpose to stop the pump from rotating. I also 3D printed these pieces right here. They are just there to stop the pump from shifting side to side. I 3D printed some more of these corner pieces here, these brackets, also down here. They are not necessary because um, all of the aluminum extrusions are strongly connected by either this type of connector or these corner pieces right here. But I didn't have any more of these aluminum plates, so I just thought I would 3D print some. I also 3D printed these feet here. They have some thick uh, rubber padding on uh, the bottom to absorb any vibrations that might be caused by the pump. If you have seen my other videos about the liquefaction of oxygen and nitrogen, you know that I removed all of the insides of the pump, which means I have to put them back in. But before I do that, I will clean the pump on the inside with acetone and isopropyl alcohol to get rid of um, any grease or moisture that I um, inserted there by touching it with my hands. It's not great to clean a high vacuum system with acetone or isopropyl alcohol, but I hope it will be good enough. I may have to have to bake the system to remove any traces that are absorbed to the surface. But yeah, it is how it is and I'm first going to clean everything on the inside. This is the first component that has to be installed. And as you can see, the surface here and the surface down here meet up when I will be installing it. And I have to put a thermal compound between the two surfaces to aid the heat transfer. And there was indium foil between these two uh, surfaces. If you have seen the video, my first video about the cryo pump, you can see the indium foil I removed. So I bought some new indium foil that I can cut into pieces that fit here. So I have a good thermal connection between these two surfaces. I made these stencils here that I can use to cut the indium foil. So that's what I'm going to do next. Here you can see the indium foil I bought. It's extremely soft. And as you can see, I'm wearing gloves, so I won't contaminate any of the insides of the pump with grease for my fingers. And I also put a plastic sheet on top of my workbench um, to avoid any contaminations that are on my workbench to get on the indium or any parts I'm going to install. I'm now going to transfer this to my foil so I can cut it out. I'm using some scissors that I cleaned with acetone to cut this shape out. I have to be really careful not to tear the indium foil because it's unbelievably soft. You can see this piece here and you can just snap it like this. I'm going to use this set of hole punches or whatever they're called to create the holes for the screws. I'm going to wipe it down with acetone to remove the residue of my marker. So as you can see I placed the indium foil on the contact surfaces. And I don't know if I already explained that, but I did in my first video. The indium basically has the same purpose as a thermal compound you would put between a CPU cooler and a CPU. The reason you're using a thermal compound is because all these surfaces that are um, pressed against each other have klein, uh, tiny imperfections in them and they hinder the transport of heat. So. By using a thermal compound, it fills up all those tiny imperfections and aids the um, transport of heat. It's the same 
if you're using indium as if you would use a thermal compound like you would use with a CPU. The downside with a thermal compound you would use with a CPU is that it's a liquid and it outgasses. So in a high vacuum system that's not desirable. For that reason we are using this soft metal indium. I'm now going to place this cup back inside the pump. I don't know what this is actually called. As you can see it's coated with um, active carbon or active charcoal I think it's called in the US and the reason is that it just aids the adsorption of gases. So it's installed and now I'm going to cut a piece of indium foil that I can put right here on the second stage of the cryo pump to install the second part. On top of this there's a, another cup, I don't know what the innards of this pump are called, so we need a, another indium foil piece for this area here. Here you can see the last part we're going to put on. It's going on top of this one. As you can see there's still some indium left here. It's also a little bit scratched up. So I, I suspect there was somebody in here and replaced the indium in the past. I don't want to scratch it up even further by removing the last of the indium. It's really baked into the surface and it's flat enough I think that with this indium foil the contact area will be good enough. Let's just remove some of the indium that is in the hole so I won't get it in my threads. The last part to install would be the baffle. Um, but as you can see it's dirty. It's not a problem for the vacuum because it's just uh, inorganic stuff. But I'm going to attempt to clean it up a little bit. So I cleaned the part up as good as I could and now it's going to att be attached right here. But as you can see even at these locations there is indium foil. So I'm going to replace it at these two points here and then I'm going to attach it. So you can all hear the terrible sound you never want to hear when working on turbine engines. Of course! So the pump is now completely reassembled, but there's a huge problem. The Stern Gerlach experiment will be built in KF40 flanges, and there's just no way I can connect the KF40 flange to this huge opening here. And that's what this plate is for. It's an aluminum plate, it's two centimeters thick, has a 100 millimeter hole in the middle, a little bit offset, and all of the holes, it's M16 threads, to connect it to the cryo pump. If I would have gotten this plate custom made for me, it would have been extremely expensive. But there's an awesome person that made it for me for free. I didn't have to pay any money. And I'm unbelievably grateful for people that support me in my projects by doing these things for me or supporting me on Patreon. Because I'm a student, I don't earn any money. And all of the money I earn on the site, I put in my projects. So you guys are just awesome. And if you have the capability to machine metal, be it aluminum or even better stainless steel, be it CNC or be it turning it on a lathe. And if you want to participate in these projects, um, you can contact me at my email address or write me a comment 
because in this project I will need a lot of um, custom-made metal parts for the atomic beam oven and also the detector. And if you want to support me by doing these things, I would be thankful. So let's connect this to my cryo pump. As you can see, there is a groove here I can use as an O-ring groove. And then the aluminum plate will be pressed on top of the O-ring and seal the top plate to the cryo pump. I wasn't able to find an O-ring that fits this groove perfectly, so I bought some O-ring thread. I don't know if it's called O-ring thread or not, but it's basically a thread out of rubber that you can cut in the appropriate length and use as an O-ring. According to what I've read, it is possible to use uh, cyanoacrylate glue to glue these two ends together. So that's what I'm going to use. So I was thinking about using grease or not on this o-ring. Normally you wouldn't use grease in a high vacuum application. But I decided, since this groove I don't think is meant for an o-ring, I, I think it's meant for a metal seal, um, I will use the tiniest amount of grease. So everything is done. You might wonder why I didn't design this opening here to fit a KF40 flange. The reason is that I want to use this cryo pump as a high vacuum chamber in the future. So I will use a glass bell jar on top of here and I will use the chamber for sputtering or similar experiments. And I need a opening that is as large as possible while still having some area to work on. Um, what I want to do is to use this CF100 to KF40 flange and I can use a Viton seal to seal it to this plate here and then I have 3D printed this part. I 3D printed it because I can't machine any metal um, that will press this flange on top of the base plate here to create a seal and then I can use my KF40 flanges on top to mount my Stern Gerlach experiment. If you ask yourself why this hole has to be as large as possible, the reason is that in a vacuum you're not sucking anything. That's a common misconception with vacuum systems. The molecule that is floating around in the chamber here doesn't know that there's a vacuum down there. It knows in the sense that if it's traveling in this direction there isn't anything it can hit so it, it, it won't reverse its direction. But if it's up here, it's just a statistical thing. It will bump around and at some point by chance it will flow through this opening here and it will get condensed or frozen in the cryo pump and excluded from the vacuum. But if this hole is very small, you can imagine that the particle has to bump a lot of times until it finally finds the opening it can travel through. It's the same reason why you won't find a, I don't know, six millimeter hose on a high vacuum system, because as if, if the hose is too small, your vacuum won't be good because you have to wait until the particle flows or flies through your opening. Yeah, that's everything for today's video. I really hope you enjoyed it. This will be a huge project and there will be many problems we have to solve, but I'm loving it and I hope you subscribe so you can participate and I want to hear your comments because if you have any ideas for example 
how to solve this problem better with the Viton seal. If you have any ideas how to improve this system, I would love to hear them because, you know, many brains are better than just one. And I think we can all participate in getting this to work. Thank you a lot for watching.